Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how do you drive all the boys and girls? How do you drive all the boys and girls? How do you drive all the boys and girls? How do you drive all the boys and girls? How do you drive all the boys and girls? How do you drive all the boys and girls? How do you drive all the boys and girls? How do you drive all the Testing, testing. If you can hear me, clap your hands once. If you can hear me, clap your hands twice. If you can hear me, clap your hands three times. It works. How's everyone doing today? Good. It's so good to see uh, a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Can you hear me in the back? No, you can't hear me? They didn't clap. They didn't clap. I got to put on my Barry White voice saying it. <clears throat> no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, welcome to the Avenues West Association Luncheon. We're glad to see everyone in the building. This was actually a sold out event. We tried to squeeze in as many people as possible. Um, and so with that, uh, since we tried to squeeze in so many sweet people as possible, we usually like to recognize a lot of our board members and supporters by having them stand. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to have them raise their hand. So can I have uh, either either uh, Neuroside Partners, uh, Avenues West Association, and or uh, bid members, please raise your hand. I see Tony Coleman, Millie Gonzalez, James, Jim Hill. Uh, I'm not for sure. There's a couple of people that I'm missing. I think I know John Hennessy is here. I see a couple of people in the back. Brian, I know, is in the back. Gassan, Commissioner Gassan from DPW is here. Uh, of course, Brian Scotty, we are glad to see you. We also have a couple other special guests that's going to recognize. We have uh, Jeff Altenberg, Deputy uh, District Attorney. He's in the house. We have your hand there. Jeff, let's give him a hand. Uh, uh, we, we have uh, uh, somebody I owe a great debt to here. and uh, she, she, she came in, snuck in the back there, June Moberly. Let's give June Moberly a hand. She's Executive Director of Avenue Justice Association. Uh, so it's really good to see a lot of these familiar faces. I do want to say a couple things uh, before I bring up uh, Diane uh, De La Cento from City on the Hill to give, uh, for a, a special announcement. Um, we are really excited. Our Avenues West luncheons are really have taken off, uh, and so taken off so well that we're actually now Facebooking live. So you guys all on Facebook right now. Uh, so those who can't attend, they can see it on Facebook. Uh, March 22nd, um, we are going to do something really unique. Uh, you'll hear more about it, but I'll make sure it's announced today. We've just got confirmation. Um, the four African American presidents of the Common Council, for the first time ever, will be on a panel discussing about politics, community, um, here in the Midwest side of the Triple I. Um, we weren't able to do it here, we're going to do it at the Triple I Shrine Center. So make sure you mark that on your calendar. We've got a lot of excitement about that. We want to make sure we get as many people as possible invited. So we're going to have um, a former council presidents, President Hines, uh, President Pratt, um, President Kirk, President Hamilton, and the first African American Common Council president, Mr. Ben Johnson. Thanks, Leo, for making that connection. Very good, yeah, Leo. And so we're pretty excited about that. With that said, I want to turn it over for Diane just a few minutes before we begin our program. Let's give Diane De La Centos, Executive Director from City on the Hill, a hand. Thank you so much, Keith. Can you hear me in the back? All right. Um, thank you, Keith. Keith invited me just to come up and say a few words after he heard a presentation uh, at the City on a Hill board uh, meeting at which he was elected vice president. Thank you, Keith. Uh, and uh, it involves the work that we've been doing uh, in the area of youth employment and job creation and race relations. So those three uh, subjects intersect for us. And uh, so we... Um, are in Avenues West, beautiful edifices, great institutions. We partner with so many of you and are grateful for that. We also have know that we have children and families who are struggling in poverty yet in, in our neighborhood. Uh, recently, I uh, took a look at the Distressed Communities Index, and there's been a lot of attention paid to 53206. Actually, the index is higher for 53233, which we're sitting in today. And so there's a lot of work for us to do. City on a Hill just recently joined UNCOM, United Neighborhood Centers of Milwaukee, which is a group of organizations. There are eight of us now, I believe. Uh, and we're honored to be a part of them now. 
uh, and those organizations operate on like the settlement house model from the 1800s where a neighborhood based organization would work with immigrants to help them to overcome the obstacles and to join the labor force and that's much of what we're doing now with young people in the central city of Milwaukee and so uh, our report was on a project that we uh, just completed with funding from Bader and some help from Social Innovation Project that, that I, I know uh, Shannon and I connected on once and LIFT funding from the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. So uh, just to let you know we're doing that work, you have a handout at your seats uh, and we're preparing youth for jobs through budget and banking classes, skills to pay the bills, all kinds of training beforehand. We're employing them in jobs at City on a Hill and then our goal with this project as it moves from sort of a three-year pilot into hopefully scaling it is to place those young people in some of your institutions and then provide ongoing support for you and for them as they uh, become your great employees. And uh, the last piece of it then is that we want to prepare not only the youth for the workplace, but the workplace for the young people who are coming into it. And so uh, that's an important feature to make sure that your environments, your workplaces are welcoming places for young people of color, uh, regardless of the level of diversity that you have in your organization now. And so we're offering some innovative training and bringing it into workplaces, into universities, into s healthcare and school systems. And uh, if you'd like to talk more about it, there's a card with the materials at your places. Thank you so much for giving me commercial time. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of things before we hop into the program. Uh, at your seat, you will see a calendar from the New West Side Partners uh, outlining for 2018. A lot of activity. It looks like this. A beautiful uh, calendar here, or so I should say, outline of the calendar for activities we are hoping to accomplish in 2018. A lot of things are going on. Nearwest Side Partners is really excited to be a part of this momentum of really looking at the Nearwest Side differently in our seven communities. And just to clear up uh, a little confusion, a lot of people say so. Nearwest Side Partners, Avenues West Association. What's the what's the differences? Uh, Nearwest Side Partners is really what we would consider somewhat of a community organization that's the parent organization for all seven communities in the Nearwest Side. Uh, the luncheon today uh, has been done for many years by the Avenues West Association. Avenues West is one of the seven communities in the Nearwest Side. And so we support uh, the Avenues West Association mm -hmm. doing things like this and uh, with the support of our staff at Nearwest Side Partners. Um, with that said, I'm going to ask if, I, if we can have our panelists come up and join us. And uh, as you come up to your seats, we have a little bag for you so that everybody you know where you're sitting. I do want to say we have some seats here, and I just really want to do it. Uh, the people in the back there, uh, you can come up. There's some seats available. Uh, Brian, there's a guy that's come on all the way up. No, come on up, come up, come up. I, I just I can't have you sitting there. Come on. <laughs> we all's family. <laughs> And uh, let's see, uh, hopefully we don't have to pass the mic. I think we have to pass the mic here. Maybe we can get another mic if they can do that. Lindsay, if you can hear me, move my and get another mic if possible. If they can, if they can give us another mic, if they can, it's fine. Uh, we're going to get started with this panel. I'm so glad to see everyone here. This is a really exciting one. As I mentioned, it was sold out, and I could ma probably imagine why. There's a lot going on in the city of Milwaukee. Many of us know the issues when it comes to health and wealth and even financial gaps um, for our city when it comes to race, class, and the things of that nature. And so uh, it's my just to bring together some people, I think, who may be able to add to the conversation today and help us um, kind of wade through the water and what's happening now. And for the sake of time, I'm going to ask that they can introduce themselves, just they know themselves better than I, and they can give us a, a quick download. And I start with uh, Shannon Reed, director, and I want to make sure I get it right, is director of Innovative Strategies for Boys and Girls Club at United Way. But Shannon, tell us a little about yourself if you can. Um, uh, afternoon, everyone, um, and Keith, thank you for um, the invitation. Um, Shannon Reed with United Way of Greater Milwaukee and Waukesha County. I am the Director of Innovative Strategies for Boys and Men of Color. Um, and in my work right now, you know, we are trying to figure out how do we find the best resources and access for our young men and, and, and boys of color. 
Um, we know that there are a lot of issues that are surrounding our young men, but we also know that there are a lot of systems um, that we are trying to um, move forward and help with that process. And so um, as I am doing my work at United Way, um, I am working to find what are the best strategies um, to help in that process when we're looking at uh, financial, when we're looking at financial help, when we're looking at wealth, when we're looking at education. Um, we have three strategic investments, um, education, financial stability, and health. And we understand that all of our individuals, our families, our young men are impacted by those things and how do we bring um, resources for those individuals. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, come on now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Darlene Russell, and I am. I was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I grew up in the Washington Park neighborhood. Hey, hey, Washington Park neighborhood. Hey. I attended uh, Milwaukee Public Schools throughout my career, and now I serve at the Greater Milwaukee Foundation in the capacity of a program officer. And within that, I oversee our neighborhood portfolio. And, at the, and I'm going to back up and not assume everybody knows what a community foundation is, right? Because we have some people on Facebook. So really, a community foundation works uh, within the community to strengthen it. And we do that by creating funds with donors. Um, and they leave a legacy. And those funds really go to strengthen, support, um, present needs and future needs, addressing the most pressing issues within our region. Um, and I'll leave it at that for now. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Skelton. I serve as the CEO of the Siebert Lutheran Foundation. Unlike these two, United Way and the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, we're very much of a niche funder. Uh, we fund Lutheran-affiliated schools, churches, and all sorts of social service agencies, uh, re-entry, youth development, and um, if it happens under the Lutheran umbrella, pretty much we fund it. Um, our source of um, uh, resources to do that is we were founded by a man named Albert Siebert, who was the founder of Milwaukee Electric Tool back in the 1920s. Uh, Mr. Siebert actually passed away in 1960, and he left his estate so that when the company was sold outside the family, his corporate holdings in the company would fund the foundation. And that happened in 1976 with an original infusion of $35 million. Since then, we've funded over $125 million in Lutheran-affiliated ministries and have a corpus in the investment market of about $100 million right now. Our annual grant budget is about 4.2. So we're very narrow in the sense that you have to be Lutheran to get in the front door, but underneath that, we're very broad. Uh, I had the pleasure to work with uh, Brenda uh, as uh, they were looking at a location for the uh, location in the city of Milwaukee, and they ultimately chose the near west side on 27th and Wales. We are excited to have the Sea Lutheran Foundation, and I think it speaks uh, broadly for all the foundations who are in the community and doing work in the community, but they actually they, uh, their offices are in the community. So I appreciate that, Brenda. We love it. Uh, Brenda, I'm going to start off with you, and I'm going to ask the panelists, I will I will send, uh, ask the questions, but feel free to jump in if you want to add to the conversation. But Brenda, I'm going to start off with you. What's employment, um, education, wealth, and health gaps concern you the most, and what role does your, community, your organization play to shorten those gaps? Um, we actually make, ex oh, thank you. We make extensive use of a benchmarking study that the Greater Milwaukee Foundation does every two years. It's available free on their website. I highly recommend it. It's called the Vital Signs Benchmark in Metro Milwaukee. Milwaukee is benchmarked against 15 similar cities, or at least cities um, that would have something in common. Chicago clearly is much larger, but it's one of the benchmark cities, uh, Upper Midwest. Um, probably the single largest concern we have, Keith, is Milwaukee is the 16th of 16 cities, that means at the bottom, around the black-white dissimilarity index. That means of the 16 cities, Milwaukee is the worst to live in as a person of color. When you dig below that, 
very broad metric. Many of those are economic metrics that cause Milwaukee to be the worst place to live. Uh, business ownership rates, um, venture capital coming into Milwaukee, startups in Milwaukee compared to other cities, adjusted per capita income. So we think economic opportunity, entrepreneurship, jobs, <coughs> successful reentry, those things are terribly important. And we are moving toward more funding in that okay. arena. That's good to know. Carmen, is there anyone after that? Sure. Um, um, and, and thank you for that. I think one of the things that, um, you know, you, uh, when, I, when I thought about this question, you know, I thought about a lot of different things. Um, and, and what concerns me the most? Well, I'm doing exactly that. Uh, how can we make sure that where we rate at the bottom of all things in the city of Milwaukee um, for boys and men of color, and I, and I may use the um, the shortened term of BMOC, so if you hear me say BMOC, <laughs> I'm saying uh, boys and men of color. Um, but when we talk about BMOC, how do we ensure um, that the access and resources for those individuals, that they are able to um, gain specific access to those? Um, when we talk about employment, I think one of the things that I try my best to make sure um, when we're talking about concerns, it's easy for me to talk to young men about um, getting a job, but we need to show them how to do that. Um, when I ask uh, some of my young men and the ones that I mentor, uh, I say to them, hey, let, let, me, let me give you a tie. Um, we did a summit um, last year, um, a men's summit uh, uh, in collaboration with Manpower. And one of the things that some of them didn't know how to do, they didn't know how to tie a tie. And so how can I give them access to certain things and I'm not also showing them? Um, and so one of the big concerns is, is that there's sometimes a lack of just basic skills, Absolutely. just basic things. Um, and I've been tying a tie probably all my life now. Um, and so when I see a young man and he says to me, I appreciate you showing me how to do this because I didn't know and now I do and so now you know he, he'll have a different access he'll be able to get a job he'll be able to do a lot of other things um, and so I think that's one of the other things that when we look at what's concerning our community sometimes it's just the basics how, how, how do we talk about just the basics everything they said <laughs> I just like to add as I think about some of the issues growing up in Milwaukee um, one of the things that stands out and uh, why the disparities are so pronounced in Milwaukee is the segregation. And when we look at the um, historical policies that has um, really laid out the city, not just Milwaukee, but other places, these issues really affect black and brown communities. And I think about, um, again, the housing policies I had an opportunity to go through the Unlearning Racism course at the YWCA. And as part of that course, we actually got to see a snippet of a um, documentary. And it talked about after uh, World War II, um, when uh, the vets came back from the war, and they were um, you know, given the GI Bill for housing, and how although uh, black and brown people served, they were not able to uh, get housing, I believe it was in, in Levitt, Levittown, um, something like that. Mm -hmm. So they were, so I served, you know, people served in the war, um, and that, that's where the housing, in my opinion, discrimination started. And, it, and I learned recently that Milwaukee, in our region, we had housing covenants that prevented black and brown people from li living in the suburbs. And so we may not have that, I think, on paper now, but it's so deeply ingrained in our society that it's, it's good that we do the grant making, but we also have to, to work and change and get people that's representative of the communities in office, and we have to work and start changing the policies. So for the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, you know, we do the grant making, but convening and public po policy and uh, convening research is also how we address these issues. Thank you, thank you, darling. Darling, I'm gonna um, keep going with you if you don't mind. How does your organization prioritize its work within the community? And how does the organization involve the community in those decision processes? 
So one way, um, Brenda talked about the vital sign. Oops, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So Brenda talked about the vital sign. So definitely, I would say um, our priorities. We use data. We also uh, use um, work within the community, listening, whether it's um, surveys, uh, listening circles, focus groups. Uh, but also getting out there and having our ear to the ground, working with our partners and seeing what are some of the most pressing issues and where can the foundation actually have a impact. And one way we involve community, we have uh, residents um, that sit within our um, community, our grant making uh, com uh, committee. We have residents that sit on there that help make those decisions. Uh, we've really changed since I've been at the foundation for about seven years. I would say that we, you know, as you grow and mature and you learn and you change with the environment and the community, I would really say that we uh, are changing the way that we work. So uh, recognizing that uh, we're not the end all be all, but the work that we do, we must do it uh, in tandem with the community and not um, at the community, but with the community. What is it that they need? Helping. What, are, what is it the needs, the priorities of the communities that we're serving and making sure that we're working with them. So we have um, started a small grants program in partnership with some other foundations, Northwestern Mutual and Zilber Fam Family Foundation. So although it sounds small, it's huge to for the foundation to do grants directly to resident groups who are making decisions about what they see as success within their community. <coughs> Our previous CFO could, could vouch for that. That's huge for our community foundation to do that. Uh, we also uh, work to do a neighborhood leadership institute. So we want to make sure we know that um, residents within the neighborhoods, they have skills, abilities, capacities. But how do we help support them? How do we help elevate their voice, get them to the table in the decision making um, process? So those are a few ways that we are working with the community, attending more meetings, um, and help them telling us what success is for their community and supporting them in that. And we do that through partnerships. Um, and understanding that through partnerships, is, and those uh, come to relationships, and they're not one directional. It's a give and take. And so one of the things that we, we also do, we have what is called community conversations at United Way. And community conversations are where we are bringing the public um, and other individuals in to talk about what are the issues that are plaguing our community. Um, and, and, and in 2016, we hosted probably around 30 community conversations of all different backgrounds. Um, I believe it was around, uh, I'm gonna chop up the number here, but I think it was probably uh, individuals from 215 zip codes um, so that we could get a, a broad variety of the things that were going on and and some of the issues that popped up from those community conversations um, and we're still working through those There's a lot of information that was gathered um, a couple of things we talked about is having a violence-free community um, and equity and inclusivity um, another thing was a, a clean a clean and green community and also community connectedness. And I think that's where we are as a community have to be more engaging. How do we connect our community? Um, I, I would ask you all that, um, and I, I'll save that for later. I'll save it for later. But, 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 but um, one of the things I, I would like to say to you all is that in order for us to really talk about issues, we have to be authentic and we also have to be open. And one of the things that I always like to do is, is I would ask you at some point today, open your phone, look at the top 10 contacts, and see how many of those individuals do not look like you. And take some time with that and spend some time with that, because in order for us to really be connected, we, have, we, we all have to be at the table, not just one, so. I'm sorry. Uh, no problem. At Siebert Lutheran Foundation, it's sort of easy how we prioritize our work. Uh, we do it with a faith lens, and specifically a Lutheran faith lens. So when we're looking to have an impact of the community, we're looking for Lutheran-affiliated organizations with strong leaders. Leaders are the ones that make it happen on the ground, and we ask the leader a lot about 
their experience and capability to run the program, as well as how they are engaging in their community to make sure that the ministry or program they're looking to run is really relevant to the needs in the community. The other thing I would say, as, as a um, niche funder, we have the luxury, uh, really the blessing of being able to get to know our grantees very well. So we fund, for example, at a number of urban congregations, neighborhood ministers. I know those neighborhood ministers personally. Uh, I sometimes run into them at Daddy's Soul Food um, and am able to talk to them about what they're hearing in the community how people are using the pantry at the end of the month because they're spending as much as half of their income on housing, which speaks to the uh, really deplorable situation we have around low-income housing in this community. So a lot of it is listening and relationships and partnering with the leaders that we fund, but it's all with a faith lens. And so what I hear is, Brenda, from your perspective from your role that you play in really being uh, being on the ground connecting with the churches and because I we have about I think it's seven <coughs> churches here in the neighborhood side yeah. I think you can be connected with all of them you know mm -hmm. Pastor Lisa Pastor Ed Pastor King so uh, I see that and I put out here from you these involving uh, uh, Darlene involving the community in the decision making <coughs> process that seems really powerful and then Shannon these community conversations yeah. uh, these, these community conversations they have been often they, they do they happen often um, uh, what we like to do is is you know as as we've now um, had a few of them what we're now doing is going back looking at what would as the hot topics and as we look at the hot topics we're saying okay these are things that are bubbling up to the top and if these are the things that are bubbling up to the top we need to you know do a deeper dive to see how we're going to bring those things out and so I, I'm, I'm not sure of the next one but it, it does happen based upon our, our public like we want our individuals, our community, to tell us what it is that we need to do. Real quick, I see some more people in the back. We have some chairs up here. If you're sitting by an empty chair, can you put your hand up so people know? Let's grab them. We're all family here. Shannon mentioned about the top ten contacts. This is my top ten contact in this room right here. So all my brothers and sisters. Um, I'm going to move right along and also just want to say we really re heavily rely on uh, social media. So if you feel like snapping a picture, please do snap a picture and put it on your Instagram, your Facebook, your YouTube, your new chaps and everything else. <laughs> Snapchat? Snapchat. Don't go to that site. Don't go to that site. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, when I first when I first when I first got started with the work uh, that I've been doing, I think it's a little bit over 13 years. Um, I was uh, had an opportunity to really connect with the number. I, I think I connected with Darlene at the beginning of the mainstream program, or right in the middle of it, and to give me a better understanding of the role of philan oh sorry the role of philanthropic organizations. But I'm hoping that all of you can address. Specifically, what do you see the role of philanthropic organizations when it comes to addressing the needs? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, how as communities can we partner with these philanthropic organizations to help us address these gaps and these needs within the community? And should I'm gonna throw you that question okay. first. Um, so I, I always try my best to come from a place of, a place of authenticity. Um, I, I really try to bring myself to anything that we're doing. And so when, when we're talking about um, the, what, what role and how does philanthropic play in the community, I think it's about building each other. I think it's really about, um, we know that there are a lot of things that are happening in our community. And so when we know that those things are happening in our community, how can I make sure that what Darlene is doing I can help sustain that. Um, I just met Brenda today, and, and I'm, I don't know a little too much about Lutheran, but I'm gonna learn it now. <laughs> because you need to be one of my contacts. <laughs> so I, I, I really like to live what I say. So um, I think um, the way for us to do that is we have to build relationships and we have to be authentic. Like, like really authentic. Not just I'm coming to the table to have dinner with you and then I go home. 
no, I, I need to do something after that. Right. And, and that's going to take relationship. And so if it's, um, I know one of the things that happened um, with uh, the organization on, um, I think the event was called On the Table. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And On the Table, I thought was just, a, it, was, it was a great, it was a great idea because it brought individuals from all over to talk about so many different issues. And one of the issues that I had learned um, um, in the community is we were talking about human, the human, uh, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And so I got a chance to go meet with some young ladies who gave me a whole lot of knowledge that I didn't know. And now when we're talking, now when we're seeing um, all of the things that are happening on the news, the, the hashtag Me Too and things like that, it gave me a different awareness. And reason, the reason why I now have a different awareness is because I took some time to go out and find out and learn. And so that's the thing that we have to do. We never stop learning. And we have to build relationships with one another. And it has to be authentic. It has to be authentic. And I know um, one of the things that and, and, and I talk because I, I talk to a lot of my mentees, so I'm always talking to my boys. So when I say boys, I, they, they're my boys. I, I feel like they're my, they're my boys. Um, and so I always tell them that I know that the news paints a narrative mm -hmm. of what we see at five, six, and 10. Mm -hmm. And so we have to change the narrative. And the narrative starts with all of us, not just one of us, but all of us. And so I think in order for us to build a philanthropic community together, we have to do it together. Thank you, Shannon. So from my perspective, um, I would say as a, as a community foundation, we're, we're seen as a beacon within the community. Um, we have resources. So where it's appropriate to use our leadership to move the needle on the issues, uh, use our influence when it's necessary to move the needle on the issues. But just as Shannon, I think relationships and partnerships um, in concert with the community is really the key. Uh, personally, I made a commitment this year. Sometimes we have to be uncomfortable. We're so comfortable in our circles, comfortable talking to the people we know. So for me personally, I made a commitment to meet with people that I don't normally meet with. I'm really an introvert, believe it or not. So it takes a lot of work for me to talk to people and I recharge by, by being by myself. So after this, y'all, I'm going to enjoy the, the ride home. <laughs> so, but, so today I'm going to challenge you to, to, to challenge yourself to be uncomfortable, you know, going in communities that you normally would not visit, getting to know people, suspending judgment, bringing yourself and being present and really listening. I think that that is what it's going to um, take. And I just want to add also, because we're working, and Keith, you asked about communities. How can we work better with communities and organization, knowing that the relationship goes both ways and that we're really all trying to achieve the same goal, and that is to make our community better. That is to have stronger schools, access to purposeful transportation, jobs uh, within communities that have been disenfranchised and disinvested. So I think the relationships using your leadership where you can and influence and, and becoming uncomfortable. We think that uh, philanthropy has a meaningful role in uh, investing in new models that are probably not possible in the uh, public sector, uh, particularly when there's faith involved. And we think a key part of uh, individual wellness or community wellness is spiritual wellness. And obviously, the public funded programs cannot address that part of a community's wellness. And so we think it's very important to invest in new models, new models for being church. It's not always, ha shouldn't always be inside a church building. Uh, we need to be connecting with people on the street and people on the margins. That, that's the example that we, uh, that we see in the gospel. We do that by partnering with uh, other aligned funders, uh, community organizations such as MICA, uh, working in the community, again, with a faith lens. And um, I would echo also what Shannon and Darlene have said about getting out of our own little bubble. 
that's one of the reasons I felt so strongly about our organization uh, relocating from the far western suburbs in a very homogenous fake lake office park uh, <laughs> to uh, a neighborhood-based location because these are the people we need to know and relate to and understand that the lives uh, that are being lived in our community. If, um, and as a, as a white person, I think we have an obligation to educate ourselves about um, things we can't possibly know and things that aren't taught in our schools. Amen. Darlene and I actually first became acquainted because we were in the Unlearning Racism program together at the YWCA. And there's so much about public policy going way back before World War II my family's been in the U.S. since the early 1700s on both sides. We benefited from the Homestead Act. Well, guess what? African Americans in our country at the time of the Homestead Act were not getting 40 acres and a mule. So we have an obligation as white people to get out of our own comfort zone and to engage with in conversations, as Dr. Martin Luther King and many others have said, it isn't overt racists that are causing the problem in our community. It's those of us who are complacent and not speaking up for social justice because we think we're not personally racist, but we're not fighting against racist systems. And that's at the heart of so many of our issues in Milwaukee. I pretty much feel like saying, my sisters, you know? Like um, <laughs> I see a couple uh, organizations, faith-based organizations. Of course, we have Seat on the Hill. I see Father Marco from Marquette University High School, uh, Mesmer. Uh, there's a few others, Pastor Ed's in the background. I bring them up because, uh, and this isn't on the list of questions, but I'm hoping you guys might be able to answer this, faith. Um, and um, How does faith play uh, in dealing with some of these gaps we're dealing with in the community? I know, uh, Brenda, you have a, a Lutheran-based foundation. Uh, but for any one of you, I'm uh, just going out. Is it, uh, it, it, it. Testing, testing. Okay. Find out we can get it. I'm gonna speak louder, and if we see Lindsay, we can get it. Come get it. Um, but Seber Lutheran Foundation, you guys have Seber <clears throat> Lutheran Foundation. You guys have a focus with faith. I'm curious, uh, with the Shannon Dar Darlene, does faith as you as the role that you play with your respective organization, do you see faith playing a role with dealing with the gaps we deal with in the inner city of Milwaukee. I, I, either one, even Brenda, if you want to jump in, as far as what role you see faith playing with dealing with these gaps. I'll, I'll uh, crack the ice. Okay. Uh, I see another faith-based organization, Milwaukee Jobs Works, is in the house today, guys. Welcome. Um, their program really is working with those who are potentially the most difficult um, for sustainable employment, chronically unemployed, chronically underemployed, uh, criminal records, and so forth. Um, they have embedded in their program a spiritual wellness, a forgiveness and spiritual, um, and we think that's very important. It isn't about evangelizing about the Lutheran denomination per se, it's about spiritual healing. And we think that fits in any context, no matter what your faith tradition. Yeah, yeah I, I would I would add that um, I, I don't know if we have a specific focus, but I know one of the things that we like to do is is when we're talking about young men, mm -hmm. um, we're approaching it not from faith based, mm -hmm. but we're approaching it from mindfulness. Mm -hmm. how, how do how do we how do we talk with um, our young men about um, getting ready for the day, um, and maybe not doing something faith based, mm -hmm. but but getting them getting themselves. Um, centered spiritually mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes we can uh, think that I need to get on my knees and pray um, and sometimes it's it's about how do I um, make sure that I am grounded for the day to approach the day um, and and also have some compassion for myself mm -hmm. um, and I think that also goes with um, I think all of us could, could sometimes yes, stand, a, stand right. a little bit of self-care because yeah. we can work ourselves into the ground um, and, and not take some time for ourselves. So, um, in, in my in my lane, in, in my approach, um, we are looking at more of a mindfulness approach than we are faith based. Okay. And I'll just I'll just add that uh, the Greater Milwaukee Foundation we do see. Yeah. So when we're looking at kind of 
agencies we use an asset-based approach. We do see our faith-based agencies as asset within the communities. And when we talk about communities that are um, in need and distress, thank you. We have a variety of faith-based organizations within these communities. Um, so we are looking at how do we strengthen those relationships. Um, I know we have uh, Willie Wade in the house and Millie Kobe is working with faith faith agencies um, through Employ Milwaukee. So that's a resource that we're looking to connect with and see how do we strengthen, strengthen the relationships. But I also think um, in this day and time when we talk about relationships being two directionals, we also, um, when we're connecting with a faith based organization, um, giving them an idea of how they can really uh, be more engaged. So, you know, as uh, as times change, like where where is their place? How can they um, help maybe um, in some of the healing? We know our, our communities experience trauma. So um, how do they fit into the picture? So having that conversation, because from my experience, and I'll just talk about my church, so switching, you know, put on that other hat, you know, it's it's been about will, winning souls to Christ. But as they move into community development, you know, how do they wear that other hat and serve the community? It's not that they don't want to, um, again, suspending judgment, but maybe not quite sure how do you navigate. So um, again, being able to have those conversations and suspending judgment and, and building those relationships. Take a turn, I'm gonna take a turn a little bit here. Uh, Brenda mentioned about the Greater Milwaukee Foundation's your your vital signs report. Um, I am curious to hear from all three of you. And the work that I do, working with New Westside Partners and Avenues West, uh, there's a lot going on within our community as far as the struggles we see um, with people of color and with our urban um, corridors. If you can pick one or two items, what would you say are the major factors to some of these struggles. I know you mentioned, Brendan and, and Darlene, you mentioned this historical aspect. Um, if we can look at today's lens and focus on um, today, what would you say else has contributed to some of these challenges that frankly just seem to be uh, impossible to deal with? The introverts passing to me. <laughs> um, I was actually having a conversation at a meeting last night about this same thing, and many of the challenges in our community do seem impossible to deal with. Um, but uh, a colleague's quote was, just because we can't fix everything is no excuse to not do one thing. Um, so we all have to do what we can in both our personal and our professional lives to make a difference. I think underlying a lot of the struggles in our community are um, people living with a lack of hope. Um, and that has to do with segregation, uh, racism, <laughs> lack of economic opportunity, um, and uh, generational poverty, which in many cases has created a um, disintegration of the family. And so many of the assumptions that we could make around <clears throat> civic life um, 30, 50 years ago are different now. You can't make those assumptions, which puts a much bigger burden on schools, uh, obviously puts a very significant burden on the uh, law enforcement, kind of the first um, group that deals with all of uh, social ills. So there are some really key, big root cause issues, but we all have to find a lane that we can swim in and try to have an impact. So for me, I guess I'd like to just share a little more about myself, a, a personal story. So um, I grew up, I'm the oldest of three. My mom adopted my cousins due to mental health, so we had a family of 10. My freshman, I was always an honor roll student. <laughs> yes. My freshman year of high school, uh, my dad was a breadwinner. He was a foreman, worked in the uh, River West neighborhoods. My freshman year of high school, Oh, my, my dad went to the bar every Friday. That was his thing. He had a tab. My freshman year of high school, we received a call that my dad had been shot. 
My dad was shot by the police as the bar was robbed and he was trying to get the information. He didn't die, but what it did was changed our lives. He was no longer able to be the breadwinner. Um, he turned to alcohol. Um, but in the family, we I put on the book, backpack and went to school. What it was, it was trauma. Um, my family dealt with trauma, and I feel in our communities with the things that it's trauma and it's repeated trauma. So even as you're working, we're working on some of the issues, we really got to start paying attention to the trauma because our kids are going to school. We can have the best reading program, but if I'm experienced trauma, that doesn't really matter. I can have the best job, but if I'm experienced trauma, so we really have to start paying attention of, um, paying attention to the trauma and dealing with it. Um, so each of us, you know, taking a leadership role and looking at that and paying more attention to it. And I would just, I would, I would echo exactly all of what you both said. And I think I would add, um, I think one of the things that sometimes we can forget is that we have a lane and you all can do everything you can in that lane. And um, one of the things that I that comes to mind for me is, is that as I work with a lot of youth, um, and you hit the nail on the head, um, there are, we have a lot of young people who go to school. And as they go to school, they come with so many things. Mm -hmm. And you have teachers who are trying <laughs> to teach them. And the students, aren't ready for learning. They're not ready for learning because some of them have not even brushed their teeth. They haven't brushed their teeth. Some of them have not had food. And so when we talk about trauma, how can I be ready to be engaged in a classroom or to be in school for eight hours and haven't even brushed my teeth? <clears throat> And so, what are the issues? Trauma is one of them. Poverty is another. And so on and so on and so on. But we have to take a look at those things so that we can engage from a different perspective. And I like to call it uh, compassion. We all need to have a little more compassion. Um, and I'll leave it there. So, so in a beta, doing this in my head. So we have a lack of hope, um, Brenda, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Darling, um, you mentioned this trauma. And I want to really say, I, it's, it's, I mean, hearing what you said, I mean, it's an emotional statement to see that our children, it's like they're just unprepared. How would you sum that up, Shannon? How would you, would, would you say is that uh, <coughs> uh, the family, what would you say is that cause, that leading cause for that, uh, for the, these gaps? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, and uh, what, what I would say the cause is, is that we have to look at all of the things to prepare our families. Um, we have a lot of um, women who are head of households. Um, we have a lot of families who, a lot of young men who don't have their fathers. There's not a lot of fathers in our household. And then, you know, when I say that, I say it off the cuff because I, I know a lot of good men who are raising their kids and kids that are not theirs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one of the things that we have to, to look at is, you know, employment is, is one, yeah. right? How, how do we make sure that, you know, we have individuals who are at family sustaining wages? Um, and, and let me do a quick plug, you know, this is January. This is the time where all of the mom and pop sh uh, stores pop up for taxes. Yeah. And so now they're going to charge families upwards to 600 to a thousand dollars just to get their taxes done and so we, we have to take that in consideration um you know we know that you know some of these individuals could receive the eitc information and some of them just don't know and the, the more you know the more you grow right um and so i, I think you know th there's a lot of th there's a lot of things that we can help with but those are some of the things that we have to think about how do we make sure that we have families that are still um, being able to work, um, making sure that kids are getting to school, making sure they're eating. And then, you know, you have to talk about food as well. The food that's in school, I mean, is it healthy food? So. 
thank you for taking a stab at that. At that. It's, they're all uh, amazing answers. Uh, I want to, I'm going to ask one more question, but I'm hoping we have some uh, intriguing questions from the audience. So uh, be prepared, my brothers and sisters. Uh, the last question I have for you, how can communities, whether it's here in the near west side, across the city, be better partners when it comes to our philanthropic brothers and sisters who are doing this great work. How can we do better working with you in the partnership? I don't know, Shannon, I was going to take that question. Um, I'm on, I'll pass it because I don't know what I'll be talking about. <laughs> 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 working with the yes, working with you, exactly. Working with your organization, whether it's near west side partners or whomever, how can we be better uh, partners with working with our philanthropic um, firms? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think it's through the relationships, and I think as non nonprofit organizations, um, from my perspective, knowing that you are working in concert with the folks that you're serving, although that you have a mission, is the service that you're providing, is it what's needed within the community? Um, and checking in with the folks that you're, you're providing that service to. Uh, so for me, developing those relationships um, is important. Um, I have a couple of tips. One, uh, be prepared. Um, most, a few funders like to stay very much under the radar and don't have websites, etc. But most of us have websites, specify what our funding priorities are. So it's probably not a productive use of anybody's time to come in and not be prepared because if it's not in their funding area, they might love you to death, but it's probably not going to move forward. Um, and I would say, um, be honest and try to develop an authentic relationship. And that's difficult because um, there is a power dynamic in being a funder. I personally don't like that part of the job at all because I really want to just have a conversation. And so um, ha try to develop an authentic relationship so you're able to be honest and hold us to account when you think our thinking about an issue is um, not on target based on what you need, but that needs to be done in a respectful way. So um, we need to be held accountable and we need to be able to have authentic relationships. There's way too much of a power dynamic in, the, in that whole um, dynamic to be um, helpful. Mm -hmm. I just have one thing. Okay. Oh, we're, no, we're there. Hi. Um, <laughs> what you said was important. I get a lot of individuals who call me and say, uh, "Hey, Shannon. Um, so we're looking at this, and you know, I, I want to see what what can we do together." Um, and I, I, I am a person who always like to take that call because there's always something out there that's happening that I know nothing about, and I, I want to know about as much as I can. Um, and one of my models is, is um, uh, you can't do everything, but you can do something. And so um, I think the, the best way to do that is is you have to build a relationship, um, but it also has to be something that we can really do for the community, not just for you. It's not just about you. What's the end result of what we're going to do? That's the important piece. My work is not about Shannon. It's about that young man named Marcus who called me at 12 midnight and said, I don't want to be a father. That's that's the work. That's what's important. Um, that young man that said, thank you, Shannon, for showing me, um, for taking the time to just speak with me, because some people wouldn't. That's a part of the work. Mm -hmm. And so when you're sitting down and you're going to have that conversation about what we're going to do or how we're going to build or what the next thing is going to be, make sure you take some consideration about how you're going to do it, because because that's what's important. And remember the work. It's not about you. It's not about any of us in here. It's about the work and the individuals that are impacted. That's right, question time from the audience. I hope we have some hands up. Hands up. We have one up our front. Please introduce yourself and then give us your question. Afternoon, everybody. I'm Samuel Alford uh, with the NAACP and uh, communications chair, community activist. My question uh, for the panel would be around this land and the water issue and the land laterals. Um, I think I've heard that some of the health department has received grants from uh, a government agency receiving grants to deal with the land and the water. I want to talk about economic justice 
And what do you guys think in terms of handling this lead crisis and funding it? This is my last piece. Seeing as the, the budget was $302 million to the police, $60 million to the trolley, and $75,000 for filters, uh, which seems to be imbalanced. So what do you guys think about economic justice in the city surrounding this lead issue? I mean, Kenny, when I, I know it's a little difficult because I know most of you are, are associated with the city of Milwaukee, but Jenny, you have any thoughts? It looks like you may. Well, I, I, I can add maybe a little bit. Um, I know one of the, um, when we're talking about economic, just, economic justice, I think it's, you know, right now we are trying to figure out how do we best position United Way because we know that children are impacted, yeah. and that's very important to us. Um, not only were they impacted, but we also were, um, an organization who provided the filters. Right. We provided the filters because yeah. we wanted to make sure that we knew individuals would be impacted by those, by that. Um, I think, I don't know if we have um, a specific position at this moment on what's going to happen, um, but, but we know that there are a few things that have to be kind of yeah. ironed out. There are yeah. a few wrinkles that um, need to happen. And so I think one of the things for us is United Way, um, we are going to figure out some policy um, and some process on that, um, but it's still early for us to figure out where we're going to be. Okay. However, um, we are very, very aware of what's happening um, and we are going to take a stance because we provided filters to many of our families in the city of Milwaukee and Waukesha County. Mm -hmm. okay. Additional questions from the audience? Don't be scared. Uh oh, we got. Yeah. My, my favorite alderman, former alderman, the whole entire world, uh -oh. and okay. board, Riverside Partners board member, alderman, anyway. All right. All right. Thanks, Keith. Um, the question that I have as far as uh, your organizations is that you help out a lot of nonprofit organizations throughout the city with whatever their endeavors are, and you, do, you guys do uh, your diligence to find out um, the, the best fit and the, make your dollar go the longest longest way but do you get into the stability and the interworking of the organizations how they're set up how the leadership is set up um how their budgets are uh if they're dealing in the red if they're you know some of their um all of those things that's important for uh organization to stay strong and to prosper in the future what's your approach and how deep do you get into that as an organization because you don't want to give to an organization that's not going to be around the next day. So I want to hear a little bit about your approach when it comes to that. Thank you, Mr. Bullyway. <laughs> so as a program officer, we, as a foundation, we do conduct a due diligence on agencies that receive grant funding uh, for us. So we look at the leadership, we look at the financials, um, the uh, 990s. Um, so we do do the uh, due diligence um, because we, I don't think we'll want to support an organization that we know are, that's gonna be gone tomorrow. Um, and sometimes, and even doing all the due diligence, there are some things that you have no control over I know there's been some agencies, you know, you thought they were in the black and um, for whatever reason, that was not the case. But it is a <coughs> practice of ours to do due diligence and look at financials, leadership, mission, vision, how they're working in tandem um, with the community, um, what, what has been their track record um, and, and, and uh, where we have moved to in terms of the Greater Milwaukee Foundation is even talking to folks that's receiving the service that they're, that they're uh, providing. Uh, I would just add, we do the same thing. We get pretty deep into the financial statements. We feel sustainability is very important. Um, and so that's an important angle. But the other pieces, they may be financially stable, but they may not have any measurable outcomes from the funding. And so we look at it on a couple of different levels. Have you thought about what it is you're actually trying to accomplish and how you're gonna go about evaluating whether you did so or not? And so uh, we look at both of those levels. I'm deep in conversation right now about an organization we've been a long-term funder of and 
um, th they don't have the depth of funding base that they need to be sustainable going forward. And so how to deal with that as the lead funder in a way that's respectful um, because you can't run an organization either. That's not our role. Um, it's a de it's a delicate dance. And I will just add one more thing. Thank you for asking that question. I love answering that question. Um, and I would say we do the same thing. I mean, we have a fiduciary responsibility on the agencies that we give dollars to because many of you are my community who give dollars to United Way. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very important thing that we do. We not only dig, but we also look at records. Um, we also look at who's on the board. Um, we also look at um, how the agency is functioning. Um, and so we have a process. It's a process that we go through. Um, and if there are issues, we have meetings and we also talk with CEOs um, to figure out if there is an issue, what's happening. Um, and, and what we try our best to do is, is as we are giving dollars and, 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 and know that our dollars go to programs, not agencies. So anytime that dollars are given to the program, if there's an issue, we can pull the dollars out of the program, not the agency. I think it's time for one more question. I saw Leo in the back here. Leo, I'm gonna grab you. Pastor, I'm gonna try to get you, but it depends on if Leo's question is a long one here. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Uh -oh. <laughs> thank you, Keith, and thank you to the panel. It's been a really good discussion. I really appreciate your thoughts. I have a concern that American society is becoming less democratic, and partly because of the influence of big money, there's greater and greater inequality that's really uh, adversely affecting the populations we care about. What do you think that we and you as philanthropy and us as citizens need to do or should do to try to work against some of those trends, which I think overshadow kind of the, the local philanthropy that you're engaged in? Yeah. I'll start. Get out your phone right now. <laughs> Download the app for fivecalls.org. It facilitates the process for you to be in touch with your legislators about issues that are important to you. Let's say that again. Pull out your phone, download the app for fivecalls.org, and give yourself a goal of five legislative contacts a day about issues that are important to you. Um, we had a, a dialogue recently with uh, uh, Tammy. I can't believe I'm drawing in. Uh, well, yes, yes, um, and um, she said it matters. She said it matters, and people assume on some uh, social justice issues they don't need to call her because they have her vote. She said it matters to her too. So um, be involved civically. I think with the uh, economic inequality and with two working adult households and all the other factors that cause time to be so precious, People are not engaging in our democracy, and if we don't, we'll lose it. Hey, could you give that one more time? Five calls. It's the number five mm -hmm. calls dot org. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay, this one last question. Mm -hmm. well, no, I was just going to say, Leo. One one way that um, I think uh, the foundation uh, supports uh, is through community organizing. Mm -hmm. So supporting community organizing brings bringing folks together around issues that's important to them, them go, then having them contact as uh, organizing group their uh, legislative folks. One more thing. Leo, here's the other thing. Some people don't understand the democratic process at all. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. True. So we need to go back to the basics for them to understand. So let's start there so that people understand what that means. What, what does it mean? to understand a democratic process. They, some people just don't understand that. And so I think we just need to start off with the basics too as well and, and, and inform the community. One more question. I'll wait back. Pastor Ed is asking you a super duper question. Uh-oh, I didn't put the pressure on him. Man, it's 10 seconds. 
uh, two seconds. <laughs> well, uh, two seconds, now we're in. I think one answer to was what Brenda Skelton and Sieber did, but moving down, right? On the 27th and Wells and saying, we want to be involved. So that was bringing money right into the city. Uh, the other thing, though, I sh I'm a Lutheran minister, Shannon. Yes, uh, you want to join a Lutheran church? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> that sounds good. Yep. You can see me after the meeting. Sounds good. But the other thing, uh, Seabird Foundation, at times you, you had that change and die, right, conference? And I think using the influence, she brought together Missouri Synod, Wisconsin Synod, and ELCA. And uh, is really effective. And part of it is using the influence of the funding that you give that calls people to the table. And so I think there much more can be done on those around issues that are critical to the community by, the, by you folks. You do a good job, but more can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ed. We're about to wrap this up. Let's give our panel a hand. Uh, we put together a special gift bag for our panelists. You have a Near West Side Partners t-shirt in there, or Avenues West mug, a Near West Side Partners lapel pin, and a special gift from the Ambassador Hotel, 28% off your next meal. So make sure you come back here and get a bite to eat. Once again, let's give them a hand. <laughs> I want to thank all our supporters for not just the New Side Partners, but also for Avenues West. Uh, we want to continue to keep doing this. And make sure you mark on your calendar the March 22nd lunch in. Once again, we will be switching locations for the first time, having at the Triple I. Uh, but we look forward to that good event. With that said, thank you all. Have the wonderful rest of the, your day. Thanks. <laughs>